Yeah. My name is Pam Bishop. I'm with the group called Concerned Citizens of Lebanon County. We do let people in from outside the county if you're interested in the uh, pipeline issues. And I thank you all for coming tonight. I want to especially thank Bill Haven for the use of this facility. It's um, a wonderful new facility for, for training that Phil Haven puts on and also for community groups such as ours. So let me know about that. I appreciate everybody coming out on a cold Friday night. A couple of housekeeping things. I would like everyone to sign in so we can keep in touch with you because we will be holding other uh, public information meetings in the future and we'd like you to know about them. And uh, also the uh, restrooms are off the front lobby and uh, there are refreshments. Get up when you feel like it and have uh, cookie grapes, pretzels, and um, some cold things to drink. I want to thank my co-sponsors uh, for tonight's meeting. That is the folks from Lebanon Pipeline Awareness, as well as from Preserve Mount Breton. We have a very ambitious agenda tonight. We're going to be going through it pretty fast. Uh, we have some uh, very uh, experienced and uh, knowledgeable speakers for you. We will have questions, but I'm not going to let that happen after every speaker. Um, I will try to keep myself and others. This is your warning that there's two minutes left and your time is up. So I have, somebody has to do this for me. Okay, that would be. Um, I'll introduce the folks. The, uh, let's say the uh, founding folks from uh, Concerned Citizens of Lebanon County. That's myself, Pam Bishop, my husband, Doug Lorenzen, over here in the corner, and uh, Phil Stover, a farmer in the West Cornwall Township. We all live in West Cornwall Township. Um, so, if I can do this, we'll get started. While this thing is warming up, I would like to uh, also mention we have invited uh, township officials, some of whom are here. We appreciate your coming and also from our county uh, commissioner, Joellen Litz is here. And I don't know if your other commissioners are here. Um, but we thank you for being here. Can you uh, help me bring this up here? It's already open. Okay. Okay. So, concerned citizens of Lebanon County. It's a new group. We are an unincorporated association of um, volunteers. I think this will do it. Okay. Uh, formed this year to uh, advocate for good government on pipeline issues. We have, as I said, joined together tonight with two other local grassroots groups. Um, because we find the subject uh, crosses all of our purposes of the three groups. Um, the mission of Concerned Citizens of Lebanon County is to keep you informed about the Sunoco Mariner East Pipeline and any similar project that may affect the health, safety, and welfare of those who live, work, and recreate in this county. We became concerned when we heard that Sunoco intends to repurpose an existing 300 plus mile pipeline built in the 1930s in our, in our county to transport gasoline east to west across Pennsylvania. That was its, its original purpose and it's filled that for many years. I am told that it stopped pumping gasoline in the 8 inch 
uh, pipeline in its in the right of way, the existing right of way. Um, several years ago, and in fact, somebody from Sunoco just told us that the um, pump station that was at 322 in the uh, was taken out of service in 2005. Um, they are calling their new project Mariner East One Pipeline. It's intended to carry explosive natural gas liquids NGLs, which consists of ethane, propane, and butane. Uh, they're byproducts of the Marcellus shale gas extraction going on in northern and western Pennsylvania. And they intend to transport it under high pressure, because you need to keep the gas under high pressure, to their facility of Marcus Hook, PA, down in the Delaware River uh, near Philadelphia. Um, their primary uh, contracts are with um, overseas users of the product uh, for, for plastics uh, manufacturing. This is a picture of the pipeline, a diagram. You'll see there's 10 little spots on there. They are the what they call their existing uh, pump stations. One is called Cornwall. That's the one that is on 322 in Butler Road, just down the road from this facility. That's Mariner East 1. They have a little piece out in the west that they're going to have to construct. Um, so that's Cornwall Pump Station. Um, told you the location. It is, uh, first came to uh, our attention when they filed petitions with the Public Utility Commission in Pennsylvania. And they asked for an exemption from local zoning from the local authority under the municipality's planning code to site shelters for the 18 pump stations they plan, the 10 existing in the 8 new, and 17 valve stations. And they wanted it from the PUC a uh, approval for uh, exemption from local land use review under the municipality's planning code. Snell will file 31 petitions against all the townships across the state through which Mariner East One will um, transport this um, uh, MG1. Okay? In our particular area, there is an existing right of way. It's been there a long time in West Cornwall Township through property here. Um, it's the existing eight inch that they are converting. There are two other pipelines in that right-of-way. They are six inch and more about that later. Uh, they will continue to carry this list east to west while they repurpose the eight inch one for uh, natural gas liquids from west to east. Um, in the 31 petitions to the BEC, they named our township. It's a party to that matter, but they have chosen not to participate that is West Cornwall Township. Um, this is um, a list of the pump stations that they propose um, in their PUC filing. You will notice that there's two in Cumberland County, one in Dolphin County in Londonderry Township, one in Lebanon called West Cornwall Township, Cornwall Station, and one in Lancaster that they have yet to say the location in West Ocala Township. Um, at the same time, they proceeded to uh, ask the PUC for exemption from the municipality's planning code and zoning. They applied to West Cornwall Township for approval of land use development plan for that site. Um, in April, our West Cornwall Township Planning Commission recommended approval of that land use plan in June, and our supervisors approved the land use plan in July. Um, the permits were issued, the zoning permit was issued in um, September on the 17th, keep in mind that date. And the building permit was issued on September 30 for an unoccupied equipment shelter, the words were chosen carefully. 
Now the PUC proceeding is all about the shelter around the pump station. The certificate of occupancy was issued on October 14th. This is a slide of what the site looked like from Starner Road, which is behind the site, so it runs uh, from Butler Road to 322, sort of diagonal behind the site. Um, through Farmer's Fields, you can see the 34-foot flare stack in this picture. September 16, before they got any of their permits, they were building. On September 19, uh, they had their zoning permit on the 17th. On the 19th, you see a crane, you see the beginning of their steel structure that became their pump station, and a farmer's uh, barn nearby. And this is September 24, and they've already enclosed the structure, the shelter, which is the subject of the PUC proceeding, which is not proceeding until 2015. They haven't even had a pre-hearing yet, let alone set hearing dates. And um, they didn't get their permit uh, for the building until the 30th of September. So they've already shown their respect for, or disrespect, for the um, local government and the county that issued the permits on behalf of the local government. So we went to the Township Supervisors in West Cornwall Township on October 13th at their regular meeting. Uh, we uh, explained that we had concerns about the permitting process that they had built before they got their permits. There was an inadequate environmental review, we allege. And we think that the pipeline and the pump station uh, offers serious threats to public health and safety. And our supervisors told us that it was out of their hands and we had only one remedy, and that was to appeal the permits. Three days later, which we did, uh, given no choice. Uh, so concerned citizens of Lebanon County and the three individuals who live in West Cornwall Township appeal to the uh, Zoning Hearing Board of West Cornwall Township. Uh, we allege irregularities in the permitting process, some of which I've explained to you, others I won't bore you with. Um, disregard for the Township's own zoning ordinance requirements and a violation of Article 1, Section 27 of the Constitution, which is the Environmental Rights Amendment, which gives local government authority and duty to um, protect the public health and safety, and uh, protect the uh, citizens' right to clean air, pure water, and the natural scenic, historic, and aesthetic values of the environment, and makes the Commonwealth and its subdivisions the trustee for the public natural resources to protect the future generations. And if you want to see that section of the Constitution, there is a copy of that. Um, we requested that the Zoning Hearing Board revoke all permits that have been issued and stop all construction. They, there is no automatic stay when you file an appeal, so the construction continues, the use continues. Um, Sunoco has uh, said uh, to us in person and also uh, uh, in uh, media that they intend to start sending product through that pipeline in December of this year. And in fact, they're testing it this weekend. There's testing going on today in the next five days. Some of you who are nearby property owners may have um, experienced that. There were some complaints about noise um, coming from that testing. And then um, this is the way it looks today. This is the shelter for the pump stations. This is what a pipeline looks like. This is Butler Road. You're looking at the pipeline you can't see because it's in the back. Okay, so it crosses um, Butler Road and goes between a uh, house and a playground in the backyard and the um, cement uh, facility, Terra Hill. And this is looking, that's looking west. This is looking east over Mount Wilson through a farmer's field. The next one to come is Sunoco's 
Marion East 2, which is a pipeline they proposed to build, which will be not 8 inch, which the existing one is, but 16 to 24 inch, they haven't decided. They have gone to uh, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission for this one, they claim it's an interstate, the other one they claim is intrastate. This is a $2.5 billion project that they just announced on November 6th, and they will or have already contacted landowners about rights of way for the Americans too. So, I've exceeded my time. I thank you for listening, and my next speaker will be from Lebanon Pipeline Awareness. Thank you. How do I switch this for you? mainly to the Atlantic Sunrise Project, a completely different pipeline than this one, which cuts across the county north to south, where this one is east to west. But we knew the Sunoco pipeline was out there, and we're really glad that someone's going to work on it now. Our main concern from the beginning was for landowners along the pipeline routes. Um, I've dealt with the gas industry for several years, and work through another pipeline issue. So I knew what was coming and wanted to share that knowledge. LPA started out presenting information on as many topics as possible uh, so landowners could make informed decisions. The topics we looked at are economic, safety, health, and environmental issues, plus more specific details as what your rights are as a landowner. We try to answer questions and provide information as much as possible. We've also tried to bring to light some of the misconceptions out there on pipelines, like it's a done deal and there's nothing you can do. We're now concentrating on organizing in individual communities because that's where the changes have to take place, in the townships. And contrary to what's said, there are things you can do, some of which you'll hear tonight. You can find information on both the Sunoco and the Atlantic um, Sunrise Projects on our Facebook page and uh, up-to-date articles and things like that. We've also just started our YouTube um, video channel and we'll have this on there tonight as long as well as the West Cornwall Township Supervisors, Supervisors meeting that's already posted. My final thought to you is to please just consider getting involved, whatever township you are in, because the fact is these pipelines will affect our entire county not just the townships that they go through. Air pollution doesn't recognize township boundaries and the economic impacts, like lower property values with higher taxes for everyone, damaged roads from trucks carrying pipes and heavy equipment, they'll be absorbed by everyone in the county. It's important to remember that we're all in this together and that together we have a much better chance to succeed. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Our organization formed three years ago, and it was our organization was formed because a local landowner owner in West Cornwall Township wanted to rezone 90.5 acres of contiguous forest from residential forest zoning to R1, R2 for high density housing. And Preserve Mount Gretna organized because we realized it would be devastating to the Gretna area to have 90 acres of forest gone and 220 units of high density housing. We appealed to the West Cornwall Township Supervisors to retain the residential forest zoning and they tabled it 
in August of 2011 until the completion of the Quorum 11 Regional Comprehensive Plan. We followed the plan for two and a half years, advocating for preservation for the area, for the whole area. At the conclusion of that plan, unfortunately, West Cornwall Township decided that there was communistic language in the plan, and it had been infected with Agenda 21, and they chose not to adopt the plan. They said it impinged on personal property rights. This past year, this summer, Sonoco's plans were passed through very quickly. And Sonoco almost ensures a definite impingement on personal property rights and farmland being taken. So where we are now is preservation, we all know, is very difficult. Mount Gretna is a unique community. Four, four municipalities converge there. And we know how important it is when one municipality makes a decision and how it affects the other. So I would definitely advocate for you as well to get very involved. Preserve Mount Gretna is concerned about the 83-year-old repurposed pipes that are going to pump ethane, butane, and propane with no mercaptan. We have a real issue with the absence of mercaptan. A farmer can go out on his land. The mercaptan is what will give a scent to the gas. They're odorless gases. So if you have a natural gas line that's leaking, it evaporates. If you have ethane, butane, I'm sorry, ethane, butane, and propane, the wet gas, without the mercaptan in it, and it's leaking from a line, it's heavier than air, and it pools and a cloud collects around it that becomes very volatile. If there's no scent in that, and a farmer hears something behind his home at 10 o'clock at night, and goes out there with the flashlight, and turns the flashlight on to find out what's going on, you can have an explosion. Talk about children playing on a swing set, and a cell phone is hit. If there's a gas leak, that has no more captain in it, there's no way for anyone to know that there's a leak on their property. So we have a real issue with that. We realize that we're captain presents problems when plastics are being produced because it's difficult to take it out of the wet gas. And I would just encourage all of you to become as knowledgeable as you can with this whole process because it affects every one of us. And Preserve Mount Gretna's mission is to preserve the land, the air, the water, and the historic character of Mount Gretna and the surrounding area. We're all in this together, and we're in it for future generations. Thank you very much. I am happy to um, introduce Sam Kaplinka Ward, who is from the Clean Air Council. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Let me just see if I can get this uh, microphone set up here. All right, can folks hear me? Yeah. Yes. All right. Thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. It's exciting to see so many folks here on a cold Friday night. My name is Sam Plinkelair, and I work with a group called the Clean Air Council. We're a nonprofit that's dedicated to protecting everyone's right to breathe clean air. Tonight, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Mariner East pipelines. Mariner East 1 and 2 are the confirmed pipelines that we have information about currently. However, there are rumors from Sunoco Logistics that there are potential plans for additional pipelines uh, in the coming years. A little bit about our Marcellus Shale program. I work as a community organizer on pipeline issues, so doing presentations very much like this throughout the eastern part of Pennsylvania. Right now, in eastern Pennsylvania, there are seven proposed pipelines, both for methane, so natural gas, and natural gas liquids, such as ethane and propane. That's a tremendous number of pipelines, and some folks are wondering why are there so many pipelines proposed currently? Well, there's a, there's a gas glut in 
Pennsylvania right now. And there are a thousand wells in the Marcellus area that are no longer turned on. They've been drilled, they haven't been turned on because there aren't pipelines to get them to market. And the question is whether or not there's actually a need for these products. Is there a need for ethane? Is there a need for methane in Pennsylvania? Currently, residential demand has not increased for natural gas since about the 1970s. But overseas, for both ethane and also methane, prices are quite high. And that's why companies are trying to get these products to the coast as quickly as possible and be able to export them overseas. So digging in a little bit to Merida East One, we've heard some talk about it. Um, it involves 50 miles of new pipeline and 300 miles of existing pipeline, both 8 inch diameter and 16 inch diameter pipelines stretching across the entire state, all the way from the west side to the east side. This pipeline is, is within the oldest 4% of pipelines in the nation. So Sunoco Logistics is proposing that they will switch the direction of the pipeline. Rather than carrying gasoline from the east to the west of Pennsylvania, instead it would carry ethane, a natural gas liquid, from, from drilling from the west to the east. It would also increase the pressure in the line from previously about 800 pounds per square inch closer to now 1,400 pounds per square inch. It would include the construction of new pumping stations and transport a total of 70,000 barrels per day. So what are natural gas liquids? In particular, they're the wet gases that come out from the wells. Whereas methane is transported primarily as a gas, the natural gas liquids under pressure are liquid. In, the, in our file review uh, conducted on the Cornwall pumping station, we found some information that contradicted what Snoke Logistics had been saying. They had been previously saying that this would be carrying propane for distribution, but from their own documentation to the Department of Environmental Protection, they stated that as of July of 2015, it would be only ethane in the line. And what is ethane? It's used primarily for plastics and antifreeze detergents. It's an industrial product. Just one more point on that. Um, there are confirmed 10-year contracts for Mariner East One that Snow Logistics has with plastic manufacturers in Europe. And you can look them up online, uh, which is raising the question, since they're before the Public Utility Commission, arguing that they're a public utility, are they actually a public utility? If they're not distributing this product to the public, then why should they be granted the benefits of being able to be exempt from local zoning and also to have the power of eminent domain. Just to give you a, a, a sense of the positioning of Sunoco Logistics, um, some folks have had a little bit of confusion, including myself at various times, of how, where is it in relation to Sunoco. So it's actually a separate company, but they're both owned, Sunoco and Sunoco Logistics are both owned by Energy Transfer Partners. To give you a sense of Sunoco Logistics pipeline accident history, um, in a quick sentence, it's not pretty. In Pennsylvania since 2006, there have been over 80,000 gallons spilled by Sunoco Logistics, primarily from corrosion, pipeline connection failures, uh, with over $6 million in property damage within the last eight years. Moving on to Mariner East 2. So when we first learned about uh, Mariner East 1 conversion, we knew that that was just the beginning. And it's now been confirmed. Sunoco, as of the beginning of this month, said they finished their open season, which is basically when a pipeline company puts out a bid for anybody who wants to buy the, the product that they will be transporting. And they said that they have concrete buyers for, for the ethane. We already knew that from seeing articles regarding uh, European plastic manufacturers that wanted to buy the gas, or in this case, the gas liquid. Uh, but Mariner East 2 would be a much more extensive product project, carrying 275,000 barrels per day, and it would extend into Ohio. So let's delve into the pumping station that's, that's right here. This, this pumping station and many other places along the Mariner East Line have had a history of spills. At this particular pumping station in the 90s, 
there was a gasoline spill. And it's been, this site has been under remediation due to that pipeline spill ever since. These are the vapor wells uh, on the site, on uh, Sonoma Logistics site. And if you've gotten a chance to look at it, basically what that means is that since there's, there was gasoline in the soil for so long, the vapor wells uh, were, were to catch some of that gasoline and pipe it into a pile of biomass in order to uh, process the volatile organic compounds and not have them be released directly into the atmosphere. But they do have a history of spills at this facility. And just on that note, um, one of the things that has been a large area of concern for the Clean Air Council and also for residents who live along the entire proposed project is if they have a history of spills historically and they're going to be increasing the pressure and changing the product and reversing the flow, what does that mean for safety implications for people who are living near the pipeline and near the proposed pumping station? In terms of the actual emissions from the pumping stations, there will be three <coughs> primary sources of air emissions. One is fugitive emissions, which is whenever you have pipelines that come together and with a fitting, and whenever you have a valve in a pump station, there's product that is able to move past the valve and leave. It's called fugitive emissions. So that's the first type of emissions. The second is from the flare. It would be a Flare that operates 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. During normal operation, it's constantly operating. At certain times though, during maintenance uh, specifically, all of the ethane in the pipeline will be flared in order to clear it, in order to actually perform maintenance on the pipeline. This is pretty uh, standard when you're t dealing with pipeline operators that every so often they have to do maintenance on the line, in which case they will flare all of the product that's in that stretch of line surrounding the pump station in order to access it. So during that time, I, I'll, I'll get to that in just a second, but here's an image of the flare you saw it before uh, in Pam's presentation as well. So the flare volume, uh, every year they're saying they will flare over 300,000 cubic feet of ethane. That's equivalent to about 23 gallons per day. If there are any maintenance issues that are unexpected on the pipeline, they would have to flare more often in order to access the pipeline. And again, it would be operating 24 hours a day. Just a little bit about volatile organic compounds. Um, in this case, it would be ethane that is releasing uh, from, from the, the fugitive emissions and it would be equivalent to approximately five constantly idling school buses, the amount of emissions um, that would be due to fugitive emissions, which is when, it's, when they kind of sneak out around the, the fittings and the valves. The carbon emissions of the facility would be equal to uh, the sequestration from 26 acres of forest or burning 34,000 pounds of coal per year, if you take into account the equivalent, the carbon equivalent um, for the facility. So what can, we, what can we do about it um, as a community and as a whole group of communities that are now living along this entire stretch of pipeline from, from west to east? So there are two things. One is the zoning appeal that you heard a little bit about from Pam. And the second one is because it's going to be uh, emitting pollutants to the, to the atmosphere and impacting residents that are living nearby, we can request a hearing. And so far, 500 people have requested a public hearing from the Department of Environmental Protection, and they have yet to grant it. So if, you, if you're interested in, a, in applying pressure, the, uh, the head of the uh, permitting chief of the Department of Environmental Protection is Tom Hanlon in this area, and there's his email, and you can send him an email in order to request and ask information, get your reporters to come out, and begin asking questions of Tom why, after 500 people requested a public hearing, has there yet to be a public hearing on this facility? If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. Uh, and I don't know, are we doing questions now, or are we going to wait till the end? We can do questions now. Okay. Yes. So if folks have questions now, I'm happy to, happy to answer them. Please just state your name before you ask your question. 
puzzle. Did I hear there, or did I see something there indicating there may be a, a reuse of existing pipes that used to carry up to 800 pounds per square inch and will now be going up to 14 or 1500 pounds per square inch? Correct. That's a lot of pressure. That's a lot of pressure. You didn't mention anything about noise in the flare operation. Is, is there a, a certain amount of noise pollution that takes place on a constant basis, or occasionally? Yeah, actually, Sandy, are you willing to talk about your experience this morning? Um, can you see me today? I just went over the hill about five o'clock this morning. About five o'clock this morning, um, I heard a noise. So I got up and I went to the basement door to listen for the furnace. Nothing there. I went to the garage to refrigerator and everything, nothing there. And it sounded like a jet engine when it's thr thrusting when you're ready to take off. So I thought, well, it has to be outside. It sounded like maybe a tractor trailer truck trying to get a mail or something. It was so loud. So I opened the garage door and walked outside. And it's coming from the hill over by the Terry Hill, where we are here. So I, you know, I couldn't go back to sleep. It was too noisy. So I waited about maybe about eight or 10 minutes. And I called up the Police, you know, 911. I mean, how did I know the plane didn't crash? You know, I didn't, I didn't see anything, but I didn't know. So I called them up, and they were kind enough to call me back in maybe about 10 minutes. They said it was a controlled release. And I'm thinking, if they're doing a controlled release, I think you do it at noon time with a warning to all the public. You don't do it a quarter after five in the morning. So it wasn't too controlled. Something happened. And I don't know what. And it went on until about 6 o'clock. So I'm glad everybody else is here, and I hope other people heard this too. And so just on that note, this week the company is doing what's called hydrostatic <laughs> testing of their pipeline, which is increasing the pipeline pressure beyond 1,400 pounds per square inch in order to see where there is ruptures. And they're counting on people living along the pipeline route to report if there is a plume of dust or anything like that, so that they can tell how many leaks there are. Secondarily, um, you'll hear from Tom in a little bit the actual video footage of another pumping station uh, that is in Ohio, where you can see what the flare looks like, and you can also hear, you have audio as well? You can actually hear what the flare sounds like. What if there were, what if there were a, a, if there was a leak and we don't have them or captain to warn people um, and there's a spark from a truck or something like that going by. How far is the traffic endangered? How far away is this? So my understanding from the research that I've done about ethane is that it's denser than air. And so, so it settles and it actually goes to the lowest point and unfortunately, if there, if there is a, a flame of any sort, then you, you would have an explosion. Um, and so if, it could reach out to the traffic going by, is what I'm saying, possibly? I don't, I don't know how the, the, the winds are in the area. And I, it, depending on how close it is and if the winds are carrying it that way, it definitely could. Thank you. Is four questions too many? No. <laughs> all right. First of all, uh, I'm not clear on what uh, technicalities or um, objections were filed. Is there a, just a brief synopsis of that? <clears throat> so, do you mean with the zoning or with the public utility commission? What she, what she oh. The zoning appeal uh, appeals the issuance of the zoning and building uh, certificate of occupancy permits. Has three kinds of permits that were issued by the county planning department because Lebanon County Planning Department is agent for West Cornwall Township. They don't have their own zoning office. So the county planning does uh, the review and the issuance for the township. Both the, uh, the zoning officers and the township and the county are essentially parties to the appeal because of that, because of the way they were issued. So the appeal is about the permits. Um, it, uh, it, have, it alleges problems with the process that was followed. It alleges that the township zoning ordinance wasn't followed. Um, and it alleges that uh, 
that the permits were issued improperly and therefore they should be revoked and we should get a, either a um, conditional use hearing before the township that was held and or, and or the permits were issued illegally because the PUC may decide it has jurisdiction and if it does then there is no power for the local government or the county to issue those permits essentially Summary. Okay, then obviously I can't comment. <laughs> so I'm going to keep asking questions. Okay? Uh, my next question is, uh, does Sunoco need a special exception? I mean, is it? are you saying it's not zoned properly? Are you saying that? No, the, zone, the zoning has been for many years, uh, according to the West Cornwall Township zoning map. That's a... Uh, manufacturing the district and it was processed as if it were a manufacturing operation. Um, so that's okay. Uh, well it isn't okay if it's a public utility. If it's a public utility it should have been processed uh, under a different part of the zoning ordinance which requires that before they can apply for their zoning and building permits they must have approval from the PUC and the air permits and any other state and federal permits that they need to operate. So the process is all uh, backwards, essentially. They've already built it, they are sending product through it, and yet they have these proceedings that are going on um, that may change their status uh, legally to one that either the PUC has jurisdiction over the siting of those buildings. If so, it's out of the county and the local government's hands. Or they should have, if the PUC ultimately, and those hearings won't be held until 2015 sometimes, it should have been uh, proceeded under the local zoning, and there are uh, we allege errors in the process used to get those approvals. So either way you look at it, um, they have they have disrespected the process because they're going ahead and building and actually operating and plan on operating next month without PUC approval. Okay. Um, I'd like to comment on that, but I won't because <laughs> I can't. Um, what exactly does repurpose mean? I mean, I, I'm familiar with water lines and sewer lines on North London Township. For instance, I went out and saw where they put this fiberglass inside and then they put this little, they blew it up there and put this little ultraviolet light that they pulled through it and it hardened and it expanded the life of the pipes so that um, they didn't have to dig up the road and that would be, have been very costly. Is this a similar process that would go through with repurposing a pipeline or how is that accomplished? No. Uh, so the, the main my understanding of, of repurposing is that they are trying to examine where they have leaks along the entire 350 miles of it and then going out and doing spot replacements. Uh, that basically means, usually they're along the road, so that means cutting down and trying to take out, and Tom's actually seen uh, this being done, and so he can talk a little bit more about it, but it's trying to take out that section of corroded pipe. And in some cases, this is cast iron that's dating back to in the 1930s. Um, so, and then trying to replace that section of pipe is, is what they're talking about in terms of repurposing. And the main element of repurposing is just that they are trying to use it for a new purpose. They're trying to put a new product in a different direction in this same pipe. It used to be transporting gasoline, as you would get from a Sunoco station. And now it is they're, they're attempting to use this in order to make money off of the, the gas boom that's been happening on Pennsylvania. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then my final question, I, I don't know quite how to ask this, but it's my understanding that there were certain municipalities along the existing pipeline that wrote into their local zoning ordinances that for anything to change or be updated, 
Sunoco would have to get public utility status, that they were backed into this, that they had to apply. So my question is kind of multifaceted. Right. If they get it for those municipalities, does that mean it's across the whole state? So what Sunoco is, is, is requesting from the Public Utility Commission is a determination that their shelters for, this, for these pump stations, that the shelters would otherwise not be allowed in the zoning of these townships. They're requesting a determination that's from the, pub, from the Public Utility Commission saying, since you're a public utility, you don't have to abide by those local zoning laws. So you can build this station independent of local zoning. I understand, but is that just for the municipalities that required it, or can they not? They're just... asking for all of them along the entire. And is that mandated, or can they just get it for those municipalities? Because if they get it for across the whole state, that means they have eminent domain powers across the whole state, right? Tom, well, but, Tom, I can't resist. You want me to take this? Um, Go ahead, and introduce me. Um, this, this is uh, Rich, Rich Raiders, uh, he's an environmental attorney that, that, is, uh, that has been helping our group and he can answer a lot of your questions for you if you'd like. Good evening, everybody. I just moved to Lebanon County about 10 weeks ago, and so I'm just getting oriented with everything. And I've been engaged by the group that Tom's working with for working on the Chester County project when I was living in Philadelphia 10 weeks ago. And to answer your question, Commissioner, the eminent domain power would come with the ratification of the PUC's decision to grant utility status to Sonoma Logistics. And so they would have all the powers and benefits of the eminent domain program as it exists for entities like UGI. Okay, just for those municipalities? For everything along the line. And that's what I was asking. Two, two notes. It would, it would be a determination that they are public utility. And they can do anything they want within whatever footprint they want to put their line, however they want to do it and they interact with the municipalities however they choose to or not to and there's a twist that we're looking at there to try to tweak them a little bit but that's going to be a bit of a challenge we're going to talk about that offline do you have a question it's related to that um if there are public utility aren't there environmental quality studies that have to be if in fact they're granted public utility status or something like this, aren't there environmental quality studies that have to be done? Aren't they required for the public utility? So in terms of the in terms of the permitting for like pump stations, they, they're doing that. They they've submitted their applications for plan approvals um, for erosion and sedimentation and also for um, for air quality. And so they are going through the regulatory hoops. Uh, did you know anything else about that? Are they, are they required to do a specific environmental impact statement? As far as I know, they're not. You know, from... Greenfields that have to go through the FERC process would have to go through EIS, but one of the advantages of taking a whole bunch of old steel in the ground and reusing it, and to answer your prior commissioner question, no, they're not going to align the thing. They're just going to use the steel as it sits if they find there's no leak in it. But for a fresh line, you're supposed to go through the EIS process to get a permit from FERC for necessity and convenience. But for a reuse of a line where you don't necessarily go through that process, you're basically free to the world substantially. And so, no, you would not fit into the EIS thing. You would be working with the individual entities within DEP and the County Conservation Commissions for stormwater permits. And if you cross into a wetland, you could end up with a Section 105 issue, or you could end up with the Army Corps of Engineers. But the Philadelphia Corps is kind of flying these days to Africans, so they've been sending some stuff out that is a little bit short on tech work so there's there's not a lot of firewall between 
that applicant in the project. Uh, not as much as you would think. And just for folks who don't know, FERC is the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and they deal with the permitting for interstate, so between state natural gas lines, uh, pipelines. So in this particular case, since it's within the state, um, for, the, for the most part, they've been saying they don't have to go before FERC, um, and they, as if they don't have to do an environmental impact statement. So we're going to transfer on over here. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Mr. Um, I would like to introduce from Chester County, um, Mr. Tom Casey, who is uh, also from West Scotia Township in Chester County, and they have, uh, he's going to tell us about his experience. I should have mentioned earlier, we did invite Sonoma, we had every reason to believe they might come, because they had, someone from Sonoma had attended our township meeting last week, and spoke for about 20 minutes, um, but uh, the public wasn't allowed to ask questions or make comments. So we had agreed with our township we would hold this meeting so that there would be time for public questions and comments. Unfortunately, Sunoco decided not to send their spokesperson to this meeting. However, you can see his comments on the Lebanon Pipeline Awareness Website? YouTube. 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 It's, uh, it was uh, recorded and uh, the film is on YouTube. Uh, so you have the benefit of hearing from the Sunoco spokesman that way. And hopefully in future meetings, maybe they'll change their mind and they'll come. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, is everybody okay? Everybody's doing okay? A lot of information coming out. Uh, it's a lot to take in. It was for, for our group and our community at the beginning. And uh, try to take, take my time and, and just kind of go through this stuff. So I'm from the director of the Chester County Community Coalition. Uh, who we are is, is just a group of people just like yourself. We were thrust into this fight when the zoning tried to come through as, as much as it did here, and um, a few residents got a notice and went to a zoning hearing. And from there, it exploded when we realized what was happening. Um, we, we're a group of just regular people, and we're a political organization, uh, Democrats, Republicans, Independents. We have um, bipartisan support from our state reps, senators. Uh, the only thing that we haven't been able to get is our federal to come on board, either Casey or Toomey. Uh, they, they don't want to hear it from us. We've met with them numerous times. They refused to give a stance. All we asked for was what they've been giving the opposition, the support. They refused to do that. This is why we're all here. This is what we're dealing with. Two thirds of the state has Marcellus Shale. That's why we're all sitting here dealing with this, this, this headache right now. This is the estimate. This is how much money we're talking. $100 trillion is under our feet. That's what they want. That's what we're up against. If you take that stat and times that by 100, that's all $100 bills. That's a big number. I had to look at that number a couple times before I could really understand what I was, I was seeing. This is the facility from Google Earth uh, before the construction. And uh, I've passed here numerous times on Hershey with my family. Never realized it was there. What we're dealing with in West Goshen is this facility. 
This was a slide that was presented to us during an April 22nd East High School meeting that, that, that we had, where we had about 400 people. And this is what Sunoco believes the impact was to our community. Two homes were, were shown in their drawing. This is the reality of where they want to place it. My home is slightly down that, that road that goes off to the right there. There are hundreds of homes. This up in the corner is the village of Shannon. There's about 700 townhomes right there. This is a half mile radius around the facility. It's a seven acre facility. You can see right here is their existing pump station. It's inadequate for what they want to do. So they needed to buy this chunk of land that's been sitting there, and that's where they want to place this. So their reality and ours are completely different. You've seen this already. Uh, the Mariner 2 project would be the dotted line. It's coming in from Ohio, West Virginia, through Houston, and across the state. They will need to purchase all new easements for this pipeline. They've made that statement clear. Jeff Shields, their spokesperson, has made that statement that they will need to purchase new easements. They are actively doing this across the state. I have not gotten my letter yet, but I can't wait to get that one. Um, I'm going to reiterate a few things that Sam has already stated. What's going to be in the line is going to be liquid ethane. They've made claims that they're looking to do propane for this year. Originally, the propane was a guise. Now they're, they're saying that they're going to provide it. But as of July of next year, it was off. And it was going to be pure ethane running through the line. The other thing that um, in those files that uh, Sam's group had found was that this flare will operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And their own, that's what they're telling the DEP. That's pretty scary. Sunoco has stated that this was going to be a part here and part overseas project. During their earnings call for Sunoco Logistics, Michael Hennigan, the CEO, made this statement. Now, in all fairness to Sunoco, the title kind of gives it away, makes us look kind of bad. So we're going to take that off, and we're just going to call them untruths. It's a little bit nicer. You can't necessarily say they're lying, but they've made these statements. Originally, there is a video from I believe it's uh, Levin County from about a year ago, where Don Zalakowicz sat in front of the county planning commission and made statements that 65% of this product will be shipped overseas. That does not say 65%, that statement right there. This statement was just made during Sunoco's third quarter earnings call. The issues. I'm going to talk about the issues for West Ocean, if you don't mind. Uh, but they're very similar to what you guys are dealing with. Uh, they want to place this facility at 202 and Boot Road. They want to have a flaring tower just like yours. The Mariner 1 project is going to repurpose the 82-year-old pipes. The pressure is going to be at 1480 PSI. And by year's end, they want to be pumping. Mariner 2 has been announced with committed shippers. There was no official filings with the DEP for this yet. All they did was have an open season. They got a certain percentage of committed shippers. The plan is to have something in by early spring, as far as we know. For us, February, Sonoga tries to get local zoning approval. Residents went to it. Zoning hearing early in March, asked a few questions. They could not answer. The zoning board granted a uh, continuance. 
they refused to come to the next one. They stepped aside then in April. They had um, that meeting at the high school. It was a fiasco for them. They had 10 experts, a team of attorneys, and they couldn't answer one question, honestly. The residents realized what we were dealing with, and uh, they pretty much solidified the entire area against them. They then changed their attorneys, hired uh, Blank Road, which Michael Kranzer is a uh, partner who was the former DP chair. He knows the ins and outs, told them what to do. They went from interstate to intrastate, which is inside the state. And we fought. We won a judgment by the administrative law judges in July. Uh, I was with Sam at the time. We were presenting somewhere out in uh, Delmar, PA, which is outside of Pittsburgh. And uh, the judges with basically said our arguments were sound. They, they gave us a judgment. Uh, they said that under the code that they're, they don't constitute a public utility. So all the arguments for our group, Clean Air Council, Delaware Riverkeeper, and Mountain Watershed were sustained. And we knew that was a limited victory, but uh, the beer that day was nice. <laughs> then it went back to the commission. We knew we had an uphill battle fighting against this. The commission on October 2nd ruled that Sunoco, that they had jurisdiction over this case and that they threw out the administrative law judge's decisions and based on um, the prima facie evidence that Sunoco is a utility and they threw it back down to the ALJs for, um, for what is it called? Remand. Remand, and that, that basically means we can argue. So, prima facie, what does this mean? I, you know, now I do. <laughs> uh, it means at first sight. And what this means is that the, as the evidence is presented, Sunoco can claim that they are a public utility. But it's subject to further evidence or information. So what they're saying is, now go argue it. Sunoco has made multiple claims in newspaper articles. I just read a uh, statement today from Blank Rome that wrote an article in the, uh, in a, in a uh, I, I guess it's a law, it's a law journal, law journal, blog, or whatever you want to call that. Uh, where they claim victory, that they are a public utility. But what he failed to mention in his article was this point. He failed to mention that the ALJs had already decided against Sunoco, and he failed to mention that they are not technically a utility yet, because we have the opportunity to argue this point, and we're arguing this point. We also have multiple um, representatives across the state, bipartisan, who, who see the need for disclosure from these companies because they know what's coming. There's a Senate Bill 504, which is a pipeline notification that many senators are trying to push and get enacted so that these companies have to tell us their plans so that we're not faced with what we're doing right now. The Medina, Ohio facility, we had to find this. They refused to tell us where this was, so with some good detective work, we located it. At the time, the flare was right along that road there. That's the gentleman's driveway that lives in the back here. But they would tell him when they were going to flare, so he didn't come out. <laughs> This is the video. Now I'm hoping that this has sound for here. Come on. Yeah, 
it's just not available. This video is available on our website and our Facebook page. If you want to see this and experience what this woman here in the front was talking about, I recommend you turn your speakers all the way up on your computer when this runs. Um, it's, it's a pretty powerful. It sounds just like a jet engine, like she stated. There's also, it's on our website, and we'll have, I can give you that information uh, and our emails there. Um, this is an audit report from the Department of Transportation. FIMSA is the organization that handles pipeline safety. This report, which is available on the DOT website and ours, had some key points. The FIMSA cannot basically do its job. It's not that it doesn't have the manpower or the expertise to do their job. They just don't have the ability to do it because there's so much out there. They had lapses in oversight and ineffective management. This is the group that is responsible for keeping us safe. Now, but FEMSA, which is the Pipeline Hazards Material Safety Administration, has now come out with an advisory bulletin, and this speaks directly to our project, and I'm going to call it ours because the Mariner East project belongs to all of us. They're alerting that hazardous liquid and gas is an issue, especially in flow reversals, with which this project is. So what they're saying is they recognize the hazards and the dangers involved with what Sunoco and other companies are trying to do with repurposing of these lines. Pipelines with a history of failure and leaks related to stress corrosion and cracking, um, and highly volatile liquid, which this material is. So there you're now saying exactly what Sonoka wants to do, it's a problem. This just came out within a few days. Sonoka has had 221 accidents in the last eight years. So what I did was, I took this information and I broke it down for you. So you can see what these were. The biggest one is corrosion. This pipe's over 80 years old. I've seen this pipe for myself. And one of the things they talk about is, um, where is it? Outside force intentional. Three incidents of intentional damage to a pipeline in eight years. You'll hear this term homeland security used. And I found out today what that means. The homeland security that they're referring to is not the homeland security that protects us from terrorism. It is a description, a descriptive word, a definition in the PA right to know law from 2008. The gentleman from the Homeland Security Office that I spoke to is praying that they change the definition, the, 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 the heading of it, and make it public safety as it should be. It says Homeland Security, and that is the term that they throw out constantly. And it, it's confusing because we all know what happens. We all know what happened in 2001. You throw out that term. Everybody gets scared, no one questions it. I questioned it. This is a picture of a pipe in my neighborhood that was removed. It's pretty, isn't it? It's better. That is what they took out of the, out of the ground. Now, in all fairness, the pipe that was laying next to it is the new one that they were replacing it with. There's 300 miles of this pipe in the ground, they've replaced one third of this line. Is there any questions?
activity. Yes. I introduce uh, Doug Lorenzen. He has um, 30 years in public and private industry and uh, public uh, agencies with uh, <coughs> hazardous waste. He's a geologist by training. He comes to us as our expert witness today. <laughs> he also knows computers better than I do.
trucks are not safe either. Uh, this would equate to um, 56 million gallons at a 5% uh, detection rate. This would equate to somewhere around 56 million gallons total that leak. They know about the 2.8. Um, gas transmitted under high pressure subject to new factors and problems with potential for more severe results. Um, they don't know exactly what they're going to get when they start pumping this under extremely high pressure in an 8 inch, 83 year old pipeline. Uh, the enormous leak problem is a result of poor monitoring techniques and uh, currents both in detected and undetected uh, leaks. And that brings you to the question, are pipelines really safe? I mean, especially single wall pipelines. This was 2012 accident, December 11th, in Sissionville, West Virginia. Uh, the cause, that was, there was an investigation of this thing, uh, and um, they found that uh, by the transportation department, and that the corrosion and no inspection had been done in 25 years. It burned the highway I-77. What happened was uh, there was a leak. Uh, the stuff came up, probably a truck went by. It formed this huge cloud of uh, highly volatile gas and set it on fire, blew up the pipe. There was a 20-foot section of pipe that was blown 40 feet from the site here. It uh, melted the highway, burned three homes. Fortunately, there was only a few people injured, injured and, um, but nobody died. So, but what happens is this stuff will rise slightly. It will form what they, I think they call a levee. And as soon as it's, a spark hits it, it will explode, suck all the oxygen out of the air around it, and um, it will start to move as a cloud, burning huge mass. It took the responders over an hour to come shut off the valves for this thing, to cut off the, the gas flow to it. And it resulted in a nine to $10 million uh, uh, payment here. Uh, there was, in that same year, I think it was a $44 million was caused in damages by, uh, by pipelines. Uh, the monitoring techniques. There's two primary methods, watching for pressure drops and a use of pigs to, to look for leaks and corrosion. Now they, they look for pressure drops in, uh, I think they have two stations, one's in uh, Sinking Springs, I believe, and there's another one, uh, I'm not sure if they don't, is it Ohio? <coughs> Anyways, um, Delma. Delma. Uh, they have, I guess, a big computer network that looks for drops of pressure in the line. And this is uh, their primary way of finding any leaks. Um, the major causes of, uh, then they have the pigs, and uh, the pigs are uh, something that stick in the line. It's a big, like a big bullet that, uh, I guess it squeals, I've never seen it currently, but it squeals when it goes through the pipeline. Um, and the major causes of the leak are equipment failure, installation, and construction, uh, which accounted for 49%, corrosion, 22%, so those two together are 71% of all the leaks. Uh, here's a picture, a uh, cutaway picture of a uh, pig. And you can see that it has, there's different kinds of these pigs. They have different, I was looking up about them, they're different shapes and sizes, but most of them look like a, maybe a torpedo or something. They're going through the line and what happens is they, they use it, I think, for three different things. One is for monitoring, they look, they can use it to look, using ultraviolet and stuff like that, uh, fancy stuff. They can look for leaks and holes and stuff. The other is they can clean the pipe uh, with this thing, and that, they, that's what they do most often, I believe, is clean. And then they also use this to separate one product from another one. Uh, 
when you when they put a product in the line and then they want to follow up with another product, they'll put this pig in afterwards, uh, or between the two products, and when the pig shows up, that's the end of the product line, and we don't have to uh, wait till the product itself doing this way. We don't have to wait for the product to reach its uh, uh, specified specifications. Uh, so this will keep the two products separated. Uh, the monitoring uh, techniques not doing the job. Detection of pressure drops is very insensitive. And pigs here, according to um, uh, a safety briefing I went to by uh, Sunoco at our local fire stations, they're only used once in five years. So that's not really adequate for monitoring. Uh, and they also sent out, Sunoco sent out a publication uh, that says, uh, well, it implies that the public may be the primary leak detection method. Uh, so if you're, they sent this to the neighbors, if you're looking, if you think there might be a look, uh, leak, look for frozen ground, dead vegetation, the animal stocks, hopefully not your dog. Uh, fire and explosion, that'd be nice to have next to your house. Hissing sound, that's always good. Uh, water vapor steam or cloud, strict water vapor stream or cloud, dirt being blown into the air, continuous bubbling in a wet or flooded area, hopefully not your pool, uh, and odor, and if you're lucky, they'll put more cap in. But most of these, they're not doing that because they want to sell it overseas, uh, the ethane, uh, for plastics, and that, I think their contracts are mainly in Norway for Scandinavia and um, Switzerland. So, like uh, Marla was saying, you hear a hissing sound or something, that, something's wrong outside, you go out with your flashlight, and that's that. What can we do to improve the safety of pipelines and related, related health of the public? My main uh, argument is to use double wall piping, or sometimes known as dual wall piping. Uh, this is simply one pipe inside another with a small annular or interstitial space between the pipes or one tank. In the gasoline industry, it's one tank inside the other one. They do that all over now. It's almost required. Uh, you can do other things, but you have to have really severe monitoring. Uh, it's required by law for service stations, oil storage, and hazardous substance and waste storage. Uh, <coughs> adopted for use by tank trucks that deliver gas, propane gas, and ships hauling pro petroleum products that are double hauled. Uh, customers of rail transport are now calling, especially, I think, even the oil industry calling for double wall tankers. And there's so many tankers that aren't double wall um, that they, and they're not gone through their useful life yet. I, don't, I think they're kind of uh, rebelling against that. But um, uh, the, the advantages for double wall system is the outer pipe almost eliminates corrosion of the inner pipe. Uh, so the corrosion would take place on the outside pipes, not on the inside pipes. <laughs> outer, okay. outer pipe will operate at lower temperature and restricting corrosion of the outer pipe. Um, if there's a leak on the inner pipe, it will be contained by the outer pipe. And this is done throughout most of all of the industries now that use that handle oil products. I don't know why the pipeline industry cannot, will not do it. It's the safest thing they could do. But the cost is only a, a, like a third more. And the maintenance is less. So I don't know. Other costs uh, such as construction and operations are very similar. Uh, Okay, so I gotta get going. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we, uh, they, we, 
went over this about there's a new guidance on flow reversals and gas conversion. Um, they, they say cite five situations uh, where it's not recommended to have a gas conversion, which means going from oil to a gas. And uh, the uh, Sunoco pipeline fits these pretty well. Um, it's an 80 year, Sunoco is an 80 year old pipeline, history of leaks, two at this pump station alone. Uh, one is still currently being uh, remediated. Uh, being repurposed for, it's being repurposed for gas, reverse and flow, inadequate monitoring and detection, carrying highly volatile and toxic gases, inadequate first respondents. The first responders come out of sinking springs, I believe, and it's going to take over an hour for them to cut off and shut off the valves at five miles apart, and they isolate the leak that way. Uh, and they're not incorporating, which is criminal in my mind, double wall pipe. Uh, what do you want Sonoco to do? <laughs> that's, what, that's what we're gonna get if we don't do something about it. I mean it's we you know it's it's okay to have in a lot of respects to have the pipeline, but if they're not willing to, to run it correctly and they know what the industry standard should be, and they don't do it, why should they be allowed to go out? But the federal government is not requiring them to do it. God knows why. <laughs> we found like a... Space is only this big in my propane thing, and I thought there was a jet taking off in my cottage. So I can't imagine what that would be like. So, how often might they let those flares off if we can convince them to get double piping, demand that they get double pipes? Double, double I better take this the design of this pumping station is that the ethane or propane or butane or y grade or whatever it is that they're going to be running through that thing is going to lubricate the pump seal. Which means that a little bit of the product is going to go across the pump seal because you have to have the seal to seal the shaft of the pump from the pump driver, which I assume is going to be electric on these things from everything that you see Sam. Electric. Yeah. Then they have to vent this lubricant out of the system. And that's going to go to the flare 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year right, for there, the rest of your life. Is there any, um, when, when that's in process, how often are you hearing the noise? 24-7? Yeah. Yes. There are double wall uh, seal systems that they could install, but it costs more money and they have not elected to do so. <coughs> These things basically, everybody's using the analogy of a jet engine. It's not quite that sophisticated, but it is about that loud. And if you're within 500 feet of this thing, it'll be your friend forever. And there are things that they can do to mitigate the noise, but generally in the standard drones and design, there's very little noise mitigation in these things because the design of this thing is basically a six or seven foot diameter steel pipe sticking up in the air with a little bit of insulation on the inside shell, but very little noise buffering. Could it hear, cause hearing loss? If you're close enough. Generally speaking, that you won't have hearing loss if you're outside the fence. But 
if you're trying to sleep at night, anything that's above 60 decibels is going to make you wake up because people are sensitive to noise at levels that are kind of not that loud. And you've got a device that's churning out 90 dB, no problem. And so, unfortunately, if the crop is low, that noise is going to travel across that field pretty quick. If you don't have five, six foot of corn out there, it'll dissipate a bit of it, and you won't hear it quite as much. Here's the sound of the flare. Now, now granted, this is just a cell phone speaker. So, yeah, so that, that's the 24-7 noise, and then when they have to flare all the volume in the pipeline, that's when you get, like, the jet engine e extreme, yeah, where they're releasing everything to the flare, and that's when you have the, the full-on noise. Which, by the way, Sam, that's not in their air permit to release everything. It's only to do the maintenance section of the little piece of line from the main line to the to the VCU. Right. The releasing of the actual content in the main line, that's not, they didn't get a permit for that. Just the line that's around the pump station. Right. right. So if they have a failure. <clears throat> that's not in there. They've never disclosed how, how they're going to handle dropping 1,400 pounds off that line to anybody that I've ever heard. Correct. Usually it would be to the flare. Yeah. But that fire isn't big enough to do that. Correct. Not 10 million feet flare. Correct. I understand from something I attended years ago that they do not want to look at the local to the local emergency management agency. And we do have a team of uh, first responders who went to the Sunoco Logistics training at Mount Breton Fire. And um, while we were there, what I took away was that our people should help uh, let people know they must evacuate. and. That really what we have to do is call them, and as was stated earlier, they send their person up from uh, Reading or whatever, to Sinking Springs in Berks County, and they come and they turn off the valve. They do not want us going to the valve and turning it off. So public health and safety is, so our people basically will put their lives on the line, knocking on doors and saying, we need you to leave your home or go, you know, shelter down in the basement or whatever you're going to do. Um, for the for the hospital here, um, which the pumping station just about a mile down the road, nevertheless, for here uh, they said that they have to uh, evacuate. What are the? It's they have to evacuate in place. I guess is the term. So they they will stay here even if there's a cloud moving towards them. <laughs> It's not it's like shelter in place is the job. I believe it was Tom, I don't I think it was you had this at one of the last presentations where you presented the I think it was it was the mathematical formula of the potential incineration radius for the different size of the pipelines if there was a an incident with a particular size pipeline and the amount of pressure, et cetera, et cetera, they could calculate the incineration area. Well, that, yeah, that, that equation, um, there's, there's, it's called an impact radius. <coughs> the impact radius is under section 192 of the federal code. Essentially what that is, is it's a way of determining how far out an explosion will immediate impact of it. So there's an equation that you can use. It's 0.69 times the square root of whatever, and you get your number. Okay. So for an 8-inch pipe, 
that number is somewhere in the area of 350 feet. And as the pipe increases, uh, the size of the radius increases. The difference is this product does not fall under 192. It falls under 195 of the hazardous liquids. 195 does not have this radius calculation. When I called FIMSA to inquire why, the answer that I got surprised me. According to FIMSA, the reason for it is because nobody's actually done it. They, they haven't studied it. They, they don't have a calculation. The requirements for these products are, are stricter than natural gas. <clears throat> The safety measures that need to be implemented are, are more advanced, there's, there's more of them. So they feel that it's safe. I showed you what FIMSA is capable of and not capable of. Um, they, require, they rely heavily on the industry to police itself. FIMSA gives money, the federal government gives money to the industry uh, and to the state, 50% of that money is determined by their calculation. I mean, how would you like to have 50% of your income be able to be calculated by your own evaluation of yourself? <laughs> I mean, you know, and then you're going to an industry that's supposed to calculate the rest of that, and they rely heavily on what you say, and therefore you can get your funding. So, you know, this is what we're talking about. Um, that, that impact radius is important to know, but we're talking about a product that is much higher uh, volatility than natural gas pipelines. And that was just for one pipe, right? So if you have Mariner 1, one Mariner 1 pipe play, and then you have Mariner 2 next to it, and you have right. an instance of both pipe lines because they're laying next to each other, then that would happen to impact right? That's right. right. And there are, some, there are some things with the pipeline that, are, that we're learning that are a little confusing. Um, the public pipelines need to have a certain distance between them. Uh, well, the DP requires a minimum of 10 feet. Sunoco is saying they want 15 feet between their pipelines. There's a reason for that. It's called, uh, I hope I should get this right, galvanic reaction, which is essentially creating a car battery in the ground with the acid in the soil and the, the various metals, and it creates a, a connection that causes corrosion. So. The reason they have the distances is to help to prevent that. Plus, they also have uh, a charge that they run along the pipe that, that helps to offset and, and it keeps um, the, the pipes from connecting. So they have these reasons uh, for, for distances. But with these increased uh, pipe distance, there's also increased easement distance. So if there's a currently a 50-foot easement or a 25-foot or whatever it is, or sometimes it's unspecified by the line, my, per, my easement on my property is not specified. There's no distance. So I'm going to enjoy arguing that with them. But the, if there's a 50-foot and they want to put in a larger pipe, larger pipes come with larger easements. So that 50-foot right-of-way can now become 75 feet. Nothing is allowed to be in it. Nothing at all. Trees, shrubs. The only thing that they've allowed that I've seen is farmers to plant over top of the pipelines. But what I have seen, and I, me and Sam did a little field trip, road trip, and uh, on our way back from Delmont, and we went through some farms, and there's a noticeable difference between the crops that are growing outside the pipeline right of way and inside the pipeline. They're much smaller, they look sick. So out here, you guys have that concern. Where I live, I, we don't have that concern. But our concern is our homes that are in their desired new right of way. We are much denser where I live and, and from ours, 
in towards Marcus Hook. There are going to be historical properties that are in, in, impacted. I know of two in my neighborhood, historical properties that are going to be directly impacted by this. It takes everyone in this room to tell one person and for that person to tell another person. And uh, that's, that's what we're here for, is to give this information, to talk to you guys about this, to make you understand that this is one pipeline that's coming through. There are going to be many more pipelines trying to get to the ocean. They need to get this product overseas. Yeah. That's a good segue. Thanks, Tom. So, Article 1, Section 27. So, if everybody's, sorry, if everybody's not depressed yet, I'm going to lay one more on you. <laughs> so, my farm is uh, two miles as the crow flies from here. And um, we're down by Snitch Creek. So, I have a problem with this pipeline for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, one of the obvious ones is, is if there's a leak. And gas goes, as we've all heard, it, it kind of flows downhill. It's going to end up down on my USDA certified organic farm. I'm not sure how long my certifiers will allow me to call myself certified organic if I'm going to be having hydrocarbons through the air and potential gas you know, coming down into my fields and stuff. So that's sort of what we've been talking about here are some of the, the big, you know, the horrible, the explosions and all that stuff. But actually, the more mundane problem and a problem that really needs to be discussed and thought about is that how this is going to affect our food system. So um, I'm not sure if anybody knows this, but 50% of our produce right now that's grown in this country that we eat every day comes from the state of California. So in the state of California, all of that produce, most of that produce, 98% of that produce, comes from the San Joaquin Valley. And the San Joaquin Valley, if you've ever been there before, is a desert. And if it wasn't for the 8 million acres of irrigated land that they grow those vegetables on, they wouldn't grow anything. So the problem is that now uh, the Sierra Nevadas are not putting up the snowfall that they used to. And everybody is now aware of the drought California is now in. In its fifth year, and many people think that California in about 10 or 11 years will be out of the national produce game. They'll be able to grow produce for probably California and Arizona, but certainly not for the rest of us. Okay? So where are the rest of us going to get our food? So arguably, if you look on the maps here, you see where this pipeline is going? It crosses through some of the finest non-irrigated farmland in the world. And that's the conversation we have to start having. Because no one's, everyone's thinking about the explosion that's going to happen tomorrow, or the gas leak that's going to happen in 18 months. Where are we going to feed our country, your kids, your grandkids, in 15 years, in this finest non irrigated farmland in the world, is crisscrossed with pipes where we've seen where the yields of the crops that are growing over those pipes are half of what they are 50 feet away where there's not a pipe. So that's the conversation that we have to have. You know, everyone talks about the national security. Food is the ultimate national security. And water. And you need them both. And if we can't feed ourselves, who are we going to get it from? The Chinese? So, you know, I look at it in the context of a much bigger picture. But as um, Sherry said, it starts here. It starts with us. Right? We're not going to get help from the feds. We're not going to get help from the state. So each community has to fight for its own air and its own water and its own soil. So the next part. And I'll take your question in a second. Oh, sorry, let me ask your question first. Well, the whole watershed will be contaminated over time. Is that what I'm hearing? With the, with, with, with the same way the land will be if there's a leak, if the roll off. Well, yes, and not to mention, so she's talked about the water table, right? Not to mention the air quality. Um, I mean, you name it. Um, you know, it's no, it's no, I mean, the carcinogens that are in. Um, oil and gas petroleum products are well known. Nobody's making this stuff up. And when you look at the number of cancers that we have in our country now that we had, you know, not 50 years ago, you know, it's the food we're eating um, and it's the nature of our air and our water. And, you know, it's, it almost seems so obvious, but it starts with a group like this. 
right? You tell two friends, you tell two friends. And we can't stop this. Chester County has done a great job. And we can't do that. But of course, this is the part where if you ever went to Catholic school, or you went to a Catholic church, when the guy starts to hand the basket around. <laughs> so that's what I'm supposed to do now, is, is hand the basket around. So um, we had to file a legal um, briefing. What's it called? An appeal. An appeal, a stay of execution. So uh, that's costing, you know, well over a couple of thousand dollars, and that's just the beginning of it. So, you know, how you can help is you're here tonight, so that's a great start. Um, you can tell your friends uh, what's going on here and, and the, the pi uh, pipelines that are planned and how it's going to affect us, our air, our water, our soil. And then you can also help, if you can't do any of that, if you can write a check for anything you can afford. Five dollars, ten dollars, a hundred dollars. Um, that's what we need because um, we're going to start to do some fundraisers, maybe some, you know, concerts and, and pub nights and stuff like that. So that's where it's going to start. It starts at the grassroots level. And, um, and we need your help. And we have some envelopes here. Um, for Graybill, Hess, and Gibble. Gibble. Graybill and Hess. Graybill, Hess, and Gibble. Um, and they are the attorneys that are helping us in this appeal. And so if anybody can, I'll hand some envelopes out, or I'll put them here, put them on the back table. If anybody feels like they can do that, um, you know, the holidays are coming up and Christmas and all that stuff, so we understand that, but even 10 bucks will help. Stacy. Um, with the upcoming appeal, what happens if the appeal does not go in our favor? What is the next step after that? Another appeal to a higher court. Violence. And trying to end the question. Um, of course, I'm concerned about the environmental impacts, as we all are. Is there a study being done that we know of for environmental impacts? Um, my question was, is there a study that we know of that is currently being done for the environmental impacts of the pumping station? They haven't been required to yet, but that's part of our appeal. But there should have been one. Should have been at a local level. We should have required it. There is not a The zoning ordinance requires They haven't done one for us. Would it be a positive or a negative thing to do protest with signs and the 60s lady? <laughs> no, I, I think that anything we can do to begin to bubble this up into generally, you know, I mean, that's what our culture is now. If it's on TV, it's happening. If it's not on TV, it's not happening. And, you know, we, if it's our own fault. If this really proceeds like they steamrolled it so far, and it's our own fault if we don't help put the brakes on us. There, and, Sherry? Sorry. There is an upcoming meeting at the uh, Hershey Lodge of the Republican, I believe the National Republican Party is going to have a retreat at the Hershey Lodge. But it's an excellent opportunity to stand out and hold that you're so inclined with some signs. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's coming up in so January 14th, so that's that's one thing, and, and you know, not to offend any of the political people here, <laughs> but it sometimes feels like our leaders don't lead, and they they won't do something until they check the wind and they find out which way uh, public opinion is going. So it's up to us to help our leaders bring them along and say it's okay to lead. But that's what we need to do. It's, it's, it's really up to us. There's actually four things on my list that take away from this. One is you can attend the December 11th zoning hearing board hearing at the Quentin Fire Hall, 7 p.m., December 11th. It is a public hearing. The public is invited. Please leave your signs at the door. It's a very respectful proceeding, so um, once you're inside, you'll just listen. Um, there is a hearing, uh, Mike has to, a meeting Mike has to tell you about an anvil. Their, their DEP is uh, 
still deciding whether to give a public hearing on the pending air permit for the Cornwall pump station. Please contact DEP and tell them you want a hearing and they have to hold it in this township because that's where the air, air facility is that they're reviewing. You can contact your elected officials. There's an example of a municipal resolution that was adopted in Martin Township in the Lancaster County on the table if you're interested. Um, there is uh, the real core of this is Article 1, Section 27. People have the people, we are the people, have the right to clean air, pure water, and the preservation of the natural, scenic, historic, and aesthetic values of the environment. And the um, trustee for those resources are the Commonwealth and its subdivisions. There is power at the local level that the local officials don't know about. And there's duties for public health and safety. That's the, that's the, the first and foremost duty of a local official is to protect public health and safety. They don't know how to do it. They need to be educated. There are things that can be done at the local level when there's gaps in the uh, regulation of the industry because you can see how at the federal level there's gaps, at the state level there's gaps. The private property owners will be getting letters asking for rights of way and easements uh, and, uh, and talk to the call and go to public meetings that you're with your public officials and make your wishes and interests in uh, Tom. I, uh, I just wanted to uh, to let Pam know. Uh, I've s spoken to our group. We have a, a, a team of attorneys that are um, helping us from our community. Um, no one in our group gets paid except for one person, and that's our PUC attorney. Everyone else is a volunteer because they see the need, the importance of this. Our lead attorney in our in our group is uh, very well versed in um, township law solicitor. She's offered to help you. Um, she will review whatever uh, the organization, the firm that you guys have. She she's more than happy to to help out. And uh, so I just wanted to make sure you know you guys know that you're not alone. And um, this is what they, the industry does not want us to do. They do not want us to, to reach out, to talk to each other, and to look at this as a, an issue that impacts us all. Phil um, brought up a very good point: food, water, basic necessities of life. Republicans eat, Democrats eat. It's a simple fact. I mean, you have to look at it this way. Um, water is, is the most crucial part of this entire industry. They have actually done future studies looking for where they can get the water for fracking from. They've done studies about how they can drain the Allegheny River how they can go to um, Raystown Lake, which is very near here, and, and be able to drain it just enough so that it doesn't create an environmental hazard or impact, but they're going to lower it because they need the water. The problem is, is the water that goes into the ground, comes out of the ground, and it's contaminated. That they put it into these I forget, disposal, disposal storage lakes. You can use Google Earth and take your own tour of the state of Pennsylvania. Go to Texas. Honestly, you want to see what we're in, in store for? There's a town in Texas known as Ira Ann. It's basically Iran with two A's. Okay? <laughs> you, you Google that. And from that point out, just start doing the search. That is what Pennsylvania, that's what this industry wants to make Pennsylvania. These are Texas companies, energy transfer partners is from Texas. They want to turn Pennsylvania into that. That is what is being sold down in Marcus Hook. That is what is being promised to the people in that region. Jobs, they want to create 
this energy hub, just like in Texas. We don't want that. I don't want that. This, this is my home state. I love this state. I don't want to leave it, and I want to leave, <clears throat> my goal is to leave this in a better uh, place for my children than, than I leave it. So, just, just work together and, and reach out. There are other groups out there. Lancaster uh, Against the Pipeline, that group is, is a very good, well-organized group. And they are fighting the Williams line, which uh, Ann is also uh, impacted by. So there's a lot of us out there. Just work together, get on the pages, get connected, get your emails, and support the fight in any way you can. Thanks. 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 I'm one of Ann's favorite people. I'm on the conservancy board with her. Um, name's Ralph Duquette, and I'm from Campbelltown. Um, where I live, in my development, which is relatively new, is about 10 years old, we have a gas pipeline that borders the south part of the uh, development. Williams is going to be on the east side, and Sunoco is on the north side. We don't yet have one on the west side. Um, they're all within half a mile of my house, some a little closer. One of the things that I noticed when I was looking through the FERC documents for Williams is the way that they word things. For instance, um, in addressing complaints, if you are a citizen's group or a non-governmental entity like the Conservancy, they just put your comments into a general file because it's just a general state. It's not actually a complaint. So it's important that you individually, although you may work together, it's important that individually, if you get a chance to put in comments, do so. Along with the creative stuff, and I'm going to glom on to stuff that Phil and um, the gentleman from uh, Tom uh, said, water is important. When you look in back to where we're sitting here, we have a long range. It is actually a federally protected area or designated area called the Highlands, PA Highlands. It runs the New Jersey Highlands, New York Highlands, and the Connecticut Highlands. It is a huge aquifer. And for those of us who are familiar with the streams that come out of it, whether you go from the Killinger to the Bachman to the, the Bat, the Snits, and whatever else as you go east of here, they all originate up here. So I see Sid in here. Sid Hostetter is on the EAC, the Environmental Advisory Council in South London. Two days ago, two nights ago, I went before them with an idea. These companies are looking for places where there's a path of least resistance. So they'll put into the FERC documents, well, where, where are your public water supplies from? Oh, we don't need to worry about the wells because they're not publicly regulated. How do you regulate wells? Well, the DP has some ideas, but some townships have other ideas. And that idea is to make water source protection area. What I recommended or suggested to Sid and the EAC was they come together with a, a type of a, an ordinance that designates in South London area the ridges as a source water protection area. We can do the same in South Anvil. We can do the same with West Cornwall. We can do the same right down the line. We can do the same with Mount Gretna. We know Mount Gretna gets their water from this very geologic feature. It's a point not a lot of people are looking at, but it's a lot more effective than just carrying signs. Look at the places where you can create a little more work for these companies. And in some cases, you might be able to protect the communities a little bit better. So for those of you who are involved in your communities, individually, go to your board of supervisors and, and ask them, can we have this protected as a water source? It is where all the water from here to the Sorterra 
and from the other direction going into the Conestoga and the Chickies, ultimately down to Susquehanna, this is the source right here. If we can protect this, we might be able to protect ourselves from the encroachment of these pipes. It's just an idea, it may work, it may not, but there you go. Thank you, Dan. And uh, Mike has the final word to me. Mike Schroeder from Brotherhood Pipe and Hello, just very briefly, uh, Mike Broder from Manville. I cordially invite you on the Monday after Thanksgiving to um, the Anvil Township regular public meeting. I have proposed to the Township Commissioners basically since May um, that they adopt a version of the ordinance that Marty, uh, excuse me, the resolution that Marty Township just adopted. Um, they have listened attentively but have not responded on Monday, December 1st at the regular monthly meeting. Um, I, I am on the agenda and I have informed them ahead of time that I will be engaging in a dialogue with them about why the inaction and again encouraging the township commissioners to adopt such a resolution. So um, I know that if you're in, if you are not a, a resident of Advil Township, you are still cordially invited. So um, the more people we can get out next Monday, the Monday after Thanksgiving at 7.30 at uh, the town hall in Advil, the better. Thank you. I thank you all for coming tonight. Happy Thanksgiving.